when uh, five or ten percent of the population don't trust the U.S. dollar or trust the Federal Reserve, this whole thing falls apart. Hi, this is Mike Maloney, and I'm here with Jeff Clark and Chris Martinson, and we're going to have another discussion. Uh, Jeff is the moderator here, and he uh, has picked some stories to talk about. Jeff, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's uh, great to be back with both you and Chris, Mike. So uh, what an interesting week. Huh? Last time we were all together, we were all talking about all the new records that gold was making and silver, and now we're talking about a big correction. So the first story I want to throw out to you guys, I think we need to talk about, is this one on uh, Bloomberg that's talking about gold had its biggest drop in one day drop in seven years yesterday. Now, gold and silver are rebounding today. Gold's up about 2%. Silver's up about 5%. But I just want to throw out to you guys, is the worst over with this correction with gold and silver now? What do you think, Chris? Well, uh, first up, uh, I, I love how uh, Bloomberg always reports with glee whenever gold goes down. They make sure to get that headline out there right away. <laughs> sort of a sort of a U.S. sort of a thing. You, you won't see those sorts of headlines in India, for instance. But uh, the second thing is there's going to be a search for an explanation for why this is. And they might say, oh, it's because treasuries did this or investors that or vaccines or something. The truth of the matter is, is gold is still a heavily manipulated market. Uh, if you look at when it started to fall, when it started to correct, uh, it, it was in the overnight markets. And we now don't have markets where price discovery happens. That's for stocks. It's for bonds. It's for gold and silver and things like that. What we have is most of the price movements happen in the overnight markets, which is all electronic, computerized trading, very thin markets, very easy for price manipulation to happen. CFTC, nowhere on the job. They haven't been for more than a decade. SEC, nowhere to be found. Nobody cares. So when I see these price drops happen in the overnight market, my analogy for that uh, is this. It's kind of like the Oklahoma sells cattle. That's the daytime market. But uh, in Hawaii, at two in the morning, cattle suddenly you know, cratered in price and Oklahoma wakes up and finds all their cattle are worth 10% less. It's silly, but that's how it works. And uh, so we all have to report on it and talk about it. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah. What do you think, Mike? Is, the, is this it for the correction? Uh, well, you what? said that, that they were saying that uh, this was the biggest price drop in seven years. Did they say price drop or percentage drop? Because a price drop from 2,000 is very different than a price drop from 1,000. <laughs> That's, you know, you always have, I mean, the Dow either goes up or down by the biggest points, you know, amount of points in history. But the crash of 29 was much, much bigger, even though, you know, those drops, that even though the percentage uh, or the price, the point difference was almost nothing compared to today. But the percentage may have been 10 times. Uh, so that's one misleading way that the general media uh, sort of suppress it, bashes gold. They just, for some reason, uh, they love to bash gold, and I have no idea why. But when it comes to uh, them blaming gold's pullback on rising bond yields, making bonds more attractive and gold less attractive, you know, you take a look at like the, the trend over 50 years, and one of the things that you see is that suddenly, bond yields, this is something that's broken. There's something very, very wrong when you take a look at the long-term trend. But then if we zoom up uh, and look at one year, you can see that this rise was insignificant. It, it really isn't anything. And I think Chris is exactly right, that this is manipulation in the overnight markets that does it. However, gold and silver were severely overbought. And if you look at a long-term chart, uh, they were going para parabolic and climbing at a faster rate than they were when they peaked in 2011 or pretty much any other time. And so it was basically time for them to take a little rest. However, if you look at the commitment of traders and stuff, the, the, um, the big bullion banks were getting slaughtered. And so they have to stop it, crush it down, and then cover their shorts. Uh, do you agree with that, Chris? Oh, absolutely. That, that's the game that, that's been played here. And so, 
Um, what I'd love to get your perspective on, and, and Jeff as well to weigh in on, is, is uh, where are we on the, on the actual physical supply? Because we know they're getting crushed on their paper trades and all of that other stuff, and they rarely lose that game because they've got infinite amounts of paper, and they can throw it in at 1.30 in the morning, and everybody goes, oh, what happened to the price of gold? Well, what I've been increasingly concerned with is, well, where are we on the physical side? Um, because that was the part that was starting to really catch my attention was that I thought maybe 2020 could be the year we see the, the infamous comics default, meaning you know, there could be enough deliveries happening out of the comics warehouse stocks for silvers particularly, but also for gold, that we could actually see that position where the bullion banks can throw all the paper at it they want, but if they don't have the actual physical and they can't find it, that's where the actual price explosions happen. What, what, what are your thoughts there? Well, you know, have, have you read Alistair McLeod's recent article on uh, gold at 2K plus, what's the fuss? Have you read that? Yes, I have, yeah. Excellent analysis of the uh, shell game that they are playing with, uh, you know, there, there is a lack of liquidity at the major bullion exchanges on the planet and it's a shell game and it's a fractional reserve shell game. And then uh, today, there's been some tweets. Uh, I guess GLD came out with their report. And in it, they talk about uh, the, let me see. I, I think I've got it up here on one of my tabs. GLD was using the Bank of England, England as a sub-custodian and the greatest amount of gold held by the Bank of England during the quarter ended June 30, 2020, was uh, 2 million, 251,607 ounces or 6.3% of uh, GLD's trust. Uh, May 21st, it was half that. And their conclusion is that this is leased gold. It's not, you know, it's, it's, they're leasing it from the Bank of England. That where did all that gold suddenly come from? Uh, uh, it's, it's just interesting, the shell games. And if you read like GLD's prospectus, there is so much room there for them to uh, play with goal, with uh, manipulating what they are claiming is their holdings. Uh, it's so, yeah, there's a liquidity problem. Uh, we're, we're in for some, there's going to come a day. Uh, I'm hoping it's not this year. I'm, I need more time to prepare. <laughs> I know people hate that whenever I say, I, I, you know, I'm, I've been looking forward to this pullback because I can add to my position, I've, I can prepare more, uh, but I'm not fully prepared yet. And uh, uh, I, I'm more prepared than 99.9% .9 of the population, just as you are. But you are more prepared than I am currently, Chris, because of your, uh, you know, you moved to a farm and uh, you're getting ready. Do you think that the global financial system could freeze up? Do you think this is gonna be much worse than the Lehman crisis? Well, it's really a binary outcome, and that's what I'm hedging against with my personal preparations. If, you know, if I turned the camera to the side, you'd see pigs and chickens and cows. I never thought I'd be here. I'm 57. What am I doing? I'm playing farmer all of a sudden. You know, it's just not what I had in mind. Um, but here we are. And, and the reason for that is I do think it's a binary outcome. Either this works or it breaks. And even if it works, I'm still kind of squinting at that because I think that just leads to a crack up boom and ends in its own failure eventually. So, you know, is it, do we fail now or fail later? I, I got to be honest, I'm kind of hoping to fail now because I'd rather fall off the fifth rung of the ladder than the 12th rung, you know? Yeah. Um, and I just feel like every time they extend it, extend it, extend it, it just feels worse and worse and worse to me, you know? Um, and, and so that's, that's why, that's why I got, that's why I'm farming. <laughs> it does feel worse to me, uh, except I think they've already passed the point where uh, they could actually have a positive outcome on anything uh, by blowing the, the, all of the, almost all assets into hyper bubbles and having spent, not just spent any savings that we've got, but, but going so far out on debt and leverage everywhere in society uh, that when there is the inevitable, inevitable banking crisis, uh, I, I think that the whole world monetary system actually could just like fall apart and they will be scrambling to try and figure out something. Uh, I'm hoping that they look around and they go, well, what worked before? Well, that was gold. <laughs> the U.S. claims to have the world's largest uh, stockpile of gold. So, uh, you know, hopefully we can get through this. 
but backing currencies with gold again would require an astounding gold price. So um, what do you think? I mean, you said binary outcome. Binary outcome is uh, we either get through this and the dollar survives, or we go into like, a, a, you know, we could go into deflation and then this huge hyperinflation, the crack up boom that you're talking about. And at the end of every hyperinflation is the ultimate deflation because the currency goes to zero. <laughs> That's a deflation. <laughs> you know, the end of a hyperinflation is deflationary for the economy. Um, so uh, binary outcome, what do you put the, uh, you know, where do you fall as far as the, uh, the probabilities of outcome? Oh, well, thanks for asking. Um, I just put out a piece last week uh, at Peak Prosperity where, where I adjusted my odds. I, I, I'm never all in. I don't put all my chips one side or the other. But for a long time, I'd been hewing to a sort of a 50-50 deflation inflation, like it's cash and gold and silver. Like that was sort of my portfolio for too long, embarrassingly too long. And I've started to adjust that now and I'm tipping myself more towards the inflation side because I've been waiting for this big deflation. It started to happen in March. It really should have happened. I think it's still happening. You look at all the small and medium-sized enterprises that have just boarded up and gone away and and the people who aren't paying their mortgages or rent. I mean, the the deflationary impulse ought to be there. And every day I wake up and the S&P is up 40 points and the Dow's up another 300 and they're plowing to all-time new highs. And, And so that just tells me that the central banks are all in on just printing. And, and as they do that, I start to shuffle a little closer to the inflationary exit, you know, in, in, my, in my holding. So that's where I'm at. I'm busy, you know, sliding that way because I, I'm no longer 50-50 on this. I'm more like, mm, I still think deflation's a possibility, but it's less than it was just a month ago. On that topic, Chris, here's our, our next article. And that is one third of American renters are expected to miss their August rent payment. That's huge. A third of all renters in the United States are not going to be able to make their rent payment this month. So, Chris, we've had a second wave of, is the economy about to get a second wave of deflation? Well, this is the troubling part, Jeff, is that it's really a tale of two worlds. We wake up every day and see the Dow up hundreds and hundreds of points and, and, and the NASDAQ and all of that. Uh, and ostensibly that's telling us that things are awesome, but the real economy, we're seeing stories like this just piling up all over the place, uh, you know, and, and the, the really mysterious part about this that I haven't quite solved yet is that somehow in all of that environment, Apple reports record iPhone sales across all sorts of you know, geographies. I'm like, how is this? Credit card debt is coming down. People are reporting that they're saving more. They're not paying their rent, but I guess they're buying iPhones. I don't, I can't, something's not quite right in this story. Uh, and, you know, so, so it's just confusing. And so as it becomes more confusing like that, I, I'm, I'm convinced that the real economy is busy, sh- you know, shaking itself apart, but they, the authorities, they're just going to throw as much money as they have to, to make sure that it appears to be okay, especially in an election year. And that's the thing I worry about is that there's a magic moment where you throw too much financial stuff in and you can't get it back anymore. The genie's, you know, out of the bottle. And I think that's, that's why I'm shuffling slower, you know, a little bit more heavily towards inflation on this outcome because easy in, no way to get it back out again without crashing everything. And they don't want to do that. Yeah. What do you think, Mike? Uh, a third of all renters in the U.S. missing their August payment. Does that suggest maybe a second wave of deflation or you lean more toward the inflation outcome here for the rest of the year? Um, well, gold did well during the Great Depression. Uh, there, it, it has a record of doing well in deflation and inflation. Silver isn't quite as good in deflation, but I am heavily in, for every ounce of gold I own, I own more than 500 ounces of silver. Um, I am much more skewed toward a crisis hedge, not inflation or deflation hedge, but crisis hedge. And I would say that I'm not 50-50. I'm like 90-10 uh, and, uh, and, and heavily toward silver. Um, but yes, I did some videos recently. Uh, it, it had the name of a very large country in it <laughs> on the title. And I think that we got uh, throttled uh, by our 
uh, hosting service for our videos. I don't want to say anything that, that could get this video throttled, but I recommend going and looking back a couple of weeks for a video that has the name of uh, a very, very large country in it. And uh, I don't say the name of the, uh, uh, the global health problem that the world is experiencing right now either, because I think that throttles our videos. So I'm very, very careful what I say now. However, in that video, I show this an enormous real estate, you know, I went to, I shouldn't have said that, uh, back in, uh, 20, back in, Dan can just bleep it out, um, back in 2013 and showed the ghost cities and the real estate bubble. And they've continued that process and the process has worked out. Eventually, all of these empty buildings, I mean, they take just like a, s a couple of square miles and they build uh, all of these skyscrapers of apartments and malls and everything else. And, they, and eventually all of that gets sold to investors that are hoping to rent it to somebody. And this has so far worked out, except uh, the things that uh, we buy that we cut back on if there's a problem tend to be the luxury items. Uh, you know, you, you still try to pay your rent and here we've got 30% that can't pay their rent. Uh, do you think they're still buying big screen TVs and all of the other things that like the iPhones that Chris mentioned that just seemed very, very weird that there's these big profits and all these people buying iPhones. That seems bizarre to me. I just don't think it could happen. But they have the highest vacancy rate in the world uh, and this enormous real estate bubble. And there, everybody is betting on this. The entire economy is revolving around it. And <laughs> bleep that, Dan. Uh, and uh, so if we have a problem with real estate uh, here, which we're going to, it's going to cause a banking crisis. It's going to overflow over there. This is going to be a global event. It's going to be huge. I think it's going to be much, much bigger than the Lehman crisis. Uh, and I have a feeling that we're going to have the, um, I'm preparing at least, for the financial system freeze up. Maybe it'll only be a day. Maybe it'll be a week. Uh, but, or, or the, you know, Chris is in a pretty good spot with, with what he's got uh, going with the farm and everything. He's prepared for like, uh, the tail risks, the ultimate tail risks of like a total collapse of society even. And I want to be there <laughs> and I'm not yet. So uh, anyway, what is your opinion on it, uh, Jeff? And how are you skewed as far as your holdings? What are you betting on most? What's your gold silver ratio? And what's, uh, what, you know, are you betting on inflation, deflation or a crisis? That's a great question. I'm betting on crisis. So I think I win whether we get win in quotes, whether we get inflation or deflation. I'm betting on crisis that uh, authorities uh, will not be able to solve this problem, that there will be more currency printing, that they won't resolve the debt and deficit issue, uh, and maybe even some geopolitical thing blows up. So I've disclosed before, but I'll say it again, the only assets I own are physical gold, physical silver, uh, cash treasuries, and mining stocks. Yeah, that's it. And, and a little Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, that's it. I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of all in if, if, if one can say that you're all in on something. But I think this is the time to clearly be overweight, a crisis hedge, a, a government hedge, <laughs> if you will. And so that's, that's where I'm at. And uh, uh, I, I actually feel comfortable with that. And as you and I have both pointed out in a previous video, Mike, uh, we both sleep better yeah, by yeah. being positioned that way. So let's try and sneak in um, one more article if we can. Okay, I want to say one thing. Chris, you said that you were 50-50, but you're actually skewed much more toward crisis because you're not including the farm in that 50-50 mix. You're only talking about your financial assets. Am I correct? That's correct. That, that you're very much correct. In fact, uh, if, you, if you track the number one thing that I've been throwing money at as if the money had no value, currency had no value, is, uh, is uh, farm and stuff. 
I'm building my soil up. I got some tractors now. Uh, you know, anything that, that's sort of farm related, I just like, whoop, I just, I authorize that expenditure in my head. And so that's, it's, uh, but it's hard assets. It's, it's just a different hard asset play. So you're right. Um, yes, the, 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 the farm is not just a crisis edge. It's also beautiful and I enjoy it and gives me high quality of life. So, so it uh, hits a lot of cylinders for me. Very good. Let's see if we can sneak in that one last question, guys, real quick. I don't want this to be too long, but I really want to get you to weigh in on this because this article says the Fed is continuing to buy assets. Chris, as you were pointing out earlier, they're buying uh, blue chip bonds and they're also buying junk bonds. This is just astounding to me. It drives me insane. They're not buying this. They're not, they're not buying that. Some emerging central countries are. They're printing this, but what are they buying? They're buying this, junk. This is my wastebasket. This is what the Central Bank of the United States of America, the world's reserve currency, is actually buying. I mean, Mike and Chris, am I insane or are they? Chris, what do you think? <laughs> They're insane. And I'm, I want to announce, uh, actually, that I'm offering Chris bonds. I absolutely promise not to pay them back. Uh, guaranteed losses right there and uh, be very stimulative, especially for the wealth gap. So I think the Fed should be attracted to Chris Bonds very, very strongly at this point. <laughs> this is insane. We're like literally, if, if you pinched me and I woke up, I'd say, wow, that was a crazy dream. Nobody will believe it. It's yes, we're there where the Federal Reserve is buying blue chip bonds with some weird rationale that like, Walmart needs our money. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, Apple needs our money. And, uh, and junk bonds too. So yeah, it's just, it's crazy time. And so the question for everybody listening is what's, what, what additional sign would you need to see to say, that's it. We're, we're, you know, that's the last road sign, you know, that says bridge out and I better trust it. Right. So I, I mean, Mike, what, 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 what more do you think people would need to see to say, they've gone insane and I don't want to, I don't want to be part of their uh, accident, um, you know, when it finally arrives. I think everybody has different vision. Uh, I always had 2010 vision, so I could see from 20 feet what the average person had, had to stand at 10 feet to see. Uh, so at, at 20 feet, my vision was basically twice as clear. Everybody has different vision. So for me, the road sign just passed. I mean, what Jeff just said was hilarious. And what you just said was hilarious. And that is like, uh, you know, there's, there's a bridge out or at least it's got big cracks in it. And I don't trust it, as you said. Uh, but for a, a lot of people, their, their vision on this is very, very different. So the road signs, it depends on when we get to some breaking point. And is that 5% of the population? Is it 10%? But there is a breaking point and it's not 50%. When when uh, five or 10% of the population don't trust the US dollar or trust the Federal Reserve, this whole thing falls apart. Well said. Yes, very good. So thank you both uh, for joining me today. Uh, you both have free books. Uh, Mike's, if you haven't read it, you gotta read it. It's from 2000, he updated it in 2015. Just go to goldsilver.com slash free book. And Chris, what's the uh, URL? Where can people find your free book? Uh, come on by peakprosperity.com slash prosper. And uh, we've got a download there for you. Prosper talks about uh, what to do. That's great. Thank you, guys. I really enjoy this. I hope everyone else does too. And I will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Chris.